Um, all right, well, let's jump in. We're going to do, so if you've been tracking with us, we're on week four. I think this is week four of six. Uh, this week, we can talk at the end if we have time about what book we want to do. Probably we'll just do a section of a book. And my thinking is something like Judges, you know, four or five, something that has narrative and poetry or narrative and prophecy or something that has a good mix of genre. Um, but we can talk about that. Uh, and so this week we're going to do prophecy. Next week we're going to do prose. Prose Narrative is a subset of prose, but what I mean by prose is we'll look at the letters of the New Testament. That's what I mean specifically about um, that prose. So, all right, what's the goal of all Christian instruction? That's right. So you're going to turn to your partners. You're going to pull out Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, uh, and you'll read it together, and then you'll ans- ask and answer what he learned about God. So big groups, small groups, however you want to do it. But, yeah, get into groups. Make sure everybody knows everyone's name, and we're going to be answering this question. Uh, well, Mark, we're glad you're here. Um, okay, we're going to, this passage, well, I, did y'all recognize this passage from somewhere else in the Bible? Yeah, yeah. yeah where, where from? Yeah, that's right. Who reads this passage? And he basically says, I'm here, right? But that's probably not what Isaiah had in mind, and we'll talk about that um, as we work through this. But today we're going to talk about prophecy. So um, I, just on a personal note, I think part of the reason the American church has found themselves so lost on so many issues is because we don't read these books. We don't read the books of prophecy. We don't know what to do with them. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, my roommate, uh, who's at ant camp, she's out with her nieces right now, but she was like, I want to study a book this summer. What should I study? And I was like, why don't you pick a minor prophet? And I, was, and I said to her, when was the last time you did a minor prophet? And she was like, well, that would be never. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, then you should probably do a minor prophet. And so I think I had her do Amos or something like that um, just to spend some time. In. And she ended up spending the rest of the summer in all the minor prophets and was like, I had no idea. Uh, how much of this was applicable today, how beautiful it is, um, how encouraging it is, how much I learned about the Lord. And so all I have to say, I think churches are missing something when they don't talk about it. Um, But we'll talk about why. The prophets, the book of the prophets, they are hard to understand at times, and we'll talk about that. But I don't think they're impossible to understand, and I think the fruit is worth it. Um, there, when you think prophecy, you, you think of the big books. You think there's 15 books, but there's also prophecy throughout the narratives as well. So it's just like how there's book of poetry, but also poetry throughout the books as well. So there are moments like that where one, one character in a story will break out into a prophetic moment. There's prophets that show up like Elijah, Elisha, um, people like that. And so there's more than just the books, but um, I'm, when I say it's ignored, I'm, I'm saying specifically the books of prophecy. So the Old Testament, what prophecy is, they're Old Testament letters that were widely ignored until the events happened. So the prophets were not popular guys. Like, they just were, and people were like, okay, okay. Um, Like, especially Amos. Amos shows up to Israel. He's a farmer from Tekoa. He's a nobody. And he shows up to Israel to warn them, but they are in one of the most prosperous seasons they've ever been in. So imagine being the guy to come in, and everything's working. The land's expanding. The money's growing. Things are going great. And you're like, hey, y'all are not doing right by the Lord. And they're like, sure, sure. Bruno. Bruno. We don't talk about Bruno. We don't talk about Bruno. That, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, also, so my workout playlist includes a lot of The Greatest Showman and Encanto. <laughs> so Robin will be like mid set, like trying to work it out. And then it'll be like, we don't talk about it. She's like, why? Um, so, yes, that's exactly right. And it's also, I mean, it's the same issue in churches. Hey, our attendance is growing. Our tithing is growing. We are busting at the seams. And somebody comes in and says, hey, I don't think these sermons you're preaching are exactly in line with what God is trying to do. Good luck to that guy or gal who's doing that, right? So most of the time, yeah, there's some personal laughing over here so they can, they can work through. Everybody has this experience, right? Um, but they were widely ignored. I mean, they were just like, hey, like, we're not going to forfeit the land. We're winning. We're winning. And then Babylon comes, Assyria comes, and they're like, what were those guys saying? What, what was that message? Most people, when they hear prophecy, because we don't read the prophets and we just extract a couple of verses out that are, especially around Christmas, behold, a virgin will have a child, or you'll call him Emmanuel, or, you know, Bethlehem, you'll have a leader rise up. People think future telling. They think the book of prophecy is mostly future telling. It's not. There are things about the future 
Um, but really, the books of prophecy are people chosen by God. I say people. There were female prophets were in, the, in the Old Testament that were women. Um, and so, and then a little bit like Deborah plays that role too. She's a judge and a prophet. And so like, but the books, all the books that we have are men, but I don't want you to think that women didn't play this role. Um, but they're, they're people chosen by God to convey accusations. Hey, God's accusing you. And it's often legal jargon. Like he's bringing an actual legal accusation against them. Warnings. Hey, here's the consequences and expectations of renewal. And so, um, Prophecy in Greek is like pro is the prefix and then phetes is to speak, which is where we get this idea from of like, oh, we're speaking to the future. But really in Hebrew, the navaim, the navi, is one who is called to be a spokesperson for God. So think forthtelling, not foretelling. Okay, that's really what you want to get this idea out of your head that like you can flip to the prophecies and be like, what's going to happen in 400 years? That is not what they had in mind. Isaiah did not have in mind a man born, God being born of a virgin. Like that he's, he's being carried along by the Spirit. He thinks there's going to be a leader. But even Isaiah was going, what? When Jesus came on the scene, okay? Like he did not have this all fleshed out. Okay, so there's three big books of prophecy. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Those are the big guys. Uh, and then the book of the 12 is all one scroll. And it was considered one big work that they put together. So you've got three separate books. And Isaiah was its own scroll. Jeremiah was its own scroll. Ezekiel was its own scroll. And then the rest of these would be on one scroll. And they hyperlink to each other. You've got Hosea, uh, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. You can read. Um, and the, these are like one big unit. If you, if, is how they are often put together. In fact, if you go to a Bible bookstore and you want to buy a book of um, commentary on these, often you'll find commentaries written on the 12. So a commentary on all 12 together. You will also find them on individual books, but like Obadiah is not that long. So often they just clump it in uh, with other books like, or they'll clump in ones that are like all the prophets that speak to non-Israel. Um, so we'll talk about that as we jump into it. Also, uh, Larry, did you have to do this at DCS? Did you have to make charts of all the prophets? Wait a minute. DCS and charts? Why did you have to make <laughs> DCS yeah. loves charts, if y'all didn't know. That's all we did. And it was like, y'all ever been to grad school and they make you color in the pages and you think, what a waste of money? <laughs> it drives you crazy because you can literally just, anyway, I'm not going to say you can cheat, but you can. Um, I'm not saying I did. I'm not not saying I didn't, though. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but it's probably like, they're like, hey, make a chart, but there's already charts that exist. So then you're like, how am I not supposed to just look at what's there? Anyway, so we need to go. What they have you do is you'll put like the name of the book. I look, I, look, I found these. These are like nine years old. I found these in my Gmail. It was crazy. I printed them off and wasted paper. But uh, so you'd have to put like a picture and then like the key, who was the author? Who were the recipients? Who were the kings during their time? What's the theme? What's the purpose? What's the message? And what's today's application? Unique characteristics and a short outline. I'm going to do it for all the books. Um, but the one good thing that comes from this, what's the one good thing? Surely there was something good. Oh, yeah, it tells you who was also a contemporary. So, like, Isaiah and Micah were contemporaries. Isaiah and Hosea were contemporaries. So it kind of tells you, like, who's writing at the same time and things like that. If anybody wants my terrible charts that you could just Google, have at it. Um... Okay, the prophets were not only prophetic in their words, they also performed prophetic symbolic stunts. Uh, if you've not read through the prophets, there is some weird stuff. <laughs> and it always cracks me up when people find it out for the first time. When they're like, this dude was naked for three years? And I'm like, yes. Now I need you to understand that. God calls this man and says, Isaiah, walk around for three years naked. And it was meant to show the people, this is what your humiliation in exile will look like. That is commitment. I ain't doing that. So when people today are like, God called me to be a prophet, I'm like, careful. <laughs> uh, Hosea, probably one of the most famous ones because of Redeeming Love. Anybody read Redeeming Love? Yes, the movie just came out on it. Uh, God tells Hosea, go marry a prostitute. And she consistently leaves him, and he writes about it, and God's like, Israel, this is you. And so that's a pretty extreme one. Um, and then, of course, Francine Rivers made it seem like the most romantic thing you've ever read in your life. So uh, Jeremiah had a, a, an actual yoke put on him. And I think it was like three and four of Jeremiah, maybe, or eight, I don't know. And then he has someone break it off. 
Ezekiel, if you just go read Ezekiel, no, Ezekiel is the three and four. He is an absolute nutter butter, y'all. <laughs> he builds like an actual like, <laughs> like clay thing of Israel and then has like a pan and he like beats the thing and then he lays the pan on the ground and he lit, y'all, it's all crazy. But it is meant to convey a message. So they're not, these, these prophets are not just talking the talk. They're walking the walk in ways that um, it's extreme. And uh, there's a commitment to their message beyond what I think we can appreciate. And so here's the thing. Um, Isaiah walks into the country, says, hey, you need to repent. Um, he walks around naked for three years but things are going well for Israel, we do tend to ignore people like that, right? Um, and so I think we also have to have some humility for those that we would call crazy today. Now I say that, and also there's just a lot of crazy people today. So one of the things that happens to me all the time is when we turn on our TV, it defaults to the Christian Broadcasting Network. And I watch it way more than I should. Like I get sucked into it. And they say things that I'm like, that is outright false. Like, that is outright false. However, I only know that because they're taking the scriptures and twisting it. So I think there's, there's wisdom that has to be applied to all of this. Um, and I don't know that God is necessarily doing this today, but I do think it would require a great deal of humility and seeking of the Lord to have understood what they were doing. And I think some people listen. Um, certainly those who are being oppressed probably appreciate Isaiah willing to walk around on their behalf. So all that to say, it's a burden to carry. It's not spiritual Rambos. Jeremiah would rather not. They would rather not do this. Like you can imagine there's this mess of burden. And so prophets today, there are people today, they're like, man, I'm a prophet from God. Therefore, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And part of what you see in these prophets is there is real grief and lament on the part of the people. So it's not just fire and brimstone. It is also deep sadness and deep grief for the way that their country has forsaken what God has called them to do. So when people today are like, well, I'm just a prophet, that's why I say these really hard things, but they don't have the humility, they don't have the tenderness, they don't have grief over sin. Um, I'm not saying they're not a prophet, I'm just saying those go hand in hand in the biblical prophets, is both humility and grief, as well as the ability to walk in there and say really hard things to people in power. I think speaking truth to power needs to happen more often. Um, I just think if you're only doing it on Twitter and your life does not demonstrate humility and brokenness and grief over sin, I'm not sure you're actually close to Ezekiel. So that's that. Um, the prophets are like covenant watchdogs. So a lot of the language is about the covenant. You're breaking covenant. You're breaking covenant. They're constantly going back to the Mosaic Covenant. You said yes to God, remember? You said yes. You wed yourself to God, which is why there's often marriage language. It's, it's marriage-type language, though, especially at one point. I'll have you guys read Ezekiel 16. It is, was that? Car. Okay. And a dog, and who knows what else will happen. Um, spring break. Uh, but they are, they are watching to say, hey, you're breaking the covenant, and this is really serious. Uh, they were often public speeches that were then collected by the community or the prophet himself slash herself to be kept. And so ch most scholars think, probably, Amos walks in and he's like, <clears throat> you guys are sinning, please stop, woe to you all. And then he probably came back and did it the next day and the next day and the next day. Chances are this is a continual message that he's putting out, then writing down, and then trying to spread. So however you get the news out in an ancient world, that's probably what's happening. It's probably not one letter, um, and they would, have, they would have written it and sent it out. Also, literacy is much higher than we think. So just so everybody's aware, I am, this is what I'm working on in my doctorate. So chances are people had copies of these speeches. Now, they probably laughed at them, would be my guess. Oh, you hear this guy, this farmer, look at what he's saying. Woe to you, ha, ha, ha. Um, and then, like I said, they are hyperlinked to each other. You'll see phrases in one of them that is the exact same phrase used in another, and they're meant to just bounce. They're like Wikipedia pages that are connected. Okay, so why don't we read the prophets? They are hard to read. Okay, Martin Luther, for whatever you want to say about Martin Luther, he's a very good biblical scholar. He's also an utter butter toward the end. Very anti-Semitic. Martin and I love complicated people. He's a complicated man. 
But he himself, he's a very good scholar, and he says the prophets have an odd way of talking like people who, instead of proceeding in an orderly manner, ramble off from one thing to the next. So you cannot make head or tail of them or see what they are getting at. Um, one person says it's almost like a symphony, like it's the music, and then you come back. All of a sudden you're moving, you think you're moving forward, and you're like, wait, why are we back here? Wait, what are we doing? It's almost like, where are we at in time? They will bounce from future to past in, in the middle of a verse, and you're like, whoa, whoa, where are we at? They'll be like, yeah, the day of the Lord is coming. Don't you remember the covenant back in Exodus? And there will be grasshoppers as big as tanks, and you guys, you really need to remember the Exodus. And you're like, Joel, what are you talking about? Um, but you can make sense of it if you know what to look for. That's what we'll talk about. John Bright, he says, what makes the prophetic books particularly, and one might say needlessly difficult, I don't think you have the right to say that, but that's fine, um, is their very manner of their arrangement, or to be more accurate, their apparent lack of arrangement. All seems confusion. The impression that the reader gains is one of extreme disarray. One can scarcely blame him for concluding that he is reading a hopeless hodgepodge thrown together without any discernible principle of arrangement at all. Thanks, John. Um, <laughs> I don't fully agree with him. I think we've come a long way in how to read prophecy. Um, but, like, I'll tell you, like, if you're reading Isaiah and you have no tools, you will feel this. You'll be like, what are we talking about? I, this is poetry. It's strange. I don't know if we're in the future. I don't know if we're in the past. I don't know if we're talking about Jesus. I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> but we've come a long way, and we have tools now that can help us discern these things. So like, I'll tell you, I don't think Amos is that hard of a book. I don't think Micah is that hard of a book. Um, I think Isaiah is very hard. Ezekiel is very weird because it's, it's just imagery. And if you don't understand the temple state, it's weird. Um, Jeremiah gets odd, but then you get to Jeremiah 31, and you're like, yay, it's okay. Well, it'll all work out in the end, so it's fine. Um, but I don't think the minor prophets are that hard, if I'm being honest with you. Uh, okay. But part of why you have to, when we talked about the first week, you got to know when and to whom you're talking is because it helps orient you. So you've got, again, you've got Elijah and Elisha because God has a sense of humor. But you've got prophets. So just so everybody remembers, in the north, in 722, the Assyrians come in and take out the northern kingdom. They were always, the north and the south, Israel and Judah were always supposed to be united, if y'all remember. We come out of the out of the exodus, we go into the conquest. Y'all remember this conquest and then, you know, all this stuff. So we've got our kings and they're supposed to be a united kingdom. David unites the kingdom. Solomon unites the kingdom. Boom. As soon as Solomon's done, the kingdom splits. We've got the northern kingdom. All bad. All bad. 20 kings, all bad. Or excuse me, 19 kings, all bad. And we've got the southern kingdom. There's uh, 20 kings. Eight are good. 12 are bad-ish. Even the good ones, though. So... You've got prophets for the north, you've got prophets for the south, and you've got prophets before and after exile. So like Jonah, Jonah, Jonah's not writing to anyone, y'all. Jonah's a satire. I don't even know why it's on here. That's probably them saying Jonah wrote during this time, but he's not writing to Israel. Jonah is a butthead. Um, but after 722, the northern kingdom really doesn't come back on the scene. Like we just, they're, they're gone. Judah makes it a little bit longer. So there are times... When Habakkuk or Zephaniah are like, don't you remember your sister? Like Jeremiah starts with, don't you remember what happened to her? Why are you doing the same thing she was doing? Didn't you see what happened? And of course the people are like, yeah, we good. Um, and then you've got prophets during exile. And the book of Esther is written in exile as well. And then you've got your prophets post-exile. This is kind of tricky because Jeremiah also goes into exile. He writes during exile. He writes post-exile, all that. But you want to keep in mind when they're writing and the urgency by which they write. So if you look at how early Joel is, God sends Joel, and he's like, hey, if you don't turn back, there's going to be grasshoppers the size of tanks, and they're not going to flutter into each other. They're going to march systematically and take out your whole land. And you're like, what? And then Jeremiah comes, and he's like, no, for real. Like, no, for real. And they're like, <laughs> and then they get carried off in exile, which is crazy because between Joel and Jeremiah, their sister got carried off in exile. They should have been like, oh, the grasshoppers were code for an invading army. <laughs> oh, but they didn't, so they should have gotten it. But you always want to know to who and when they're writing it and all that good stuff. Obadiah is writing to the Edomites. He's not writing to Judah. Jonah is writing, I mean, he is writing to Israel, but... It's a satire. Um, trying to think of the others. Anyways, we can get through it. But 
as you're reading through it, you want to look for major themes. You want to look for breaking the covenant language. And the way you break the covenant is you worship other gods. That's a clear way that you break the kingdom, or the covenant, excuse me. Allowing social injustice. This is a huge barometer for how well Israel is doing. And we've already seen this in the narrative. So when we start the book of Judges, we do pretty well. We have a woman leading. Things are good. And by the end, it's just all in disarray. They slept with a concubine, cut up her body into 12 pieces, and sent it out to the 12 tribes. And God's like, no, I'm mad. I'm real mad. And you ask him why, and he's like, you are oppressing the poor. You continue to make the vulnerable suffer. Um, And so social injustice, poor, vulnerable, all the things we talked about in the law, when they're not doing that, God is loud about it. He lets them know this is not okay. So worshiping other gods, allowing social injustice, and then forming military alliances when he's like, you trust in so-and-so and not in me. That what they're saying is they're forming an alliance. This was Solomon's big problem. Solomon was like, yeah, I don't know about this. Let's go get cedars from Lebanon. Let's go make some deals with people. All his concubines, people were like, wow, that guy was a womanizer. No, he wasn't. He was taking those women as an allegiance with other countries. Now, he probably was a womanizer, too. I don't want to give the wrong idea. Um, but that is more than just he wanted hundreds of wives. He's making allegiances with these foreign kings and taking their daughters into his... I don't even know what that many women do, right? Because they're not going to be sleeping with him that often. So, like, do you think they were just sitting around being like, this really stinks? <laughs> or do you think they were like, girl party, and then every now and then they just, like, lock Solomon out? They're like, no, I don't know. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, Pilates was invented in Israel, yeah. No, it's never too early. Because when I'm re- reading that list there, I think America's in a pretty, pretty big trouble. I would agree with you. Because I'd say probably, you know, number one and number three, pretty much all Christians agree with, but the bottom one is that middle one. Yeah. I would agree with that. No, I, I, we did a class uh, a couple years ago where I, we went through the book of Amos and I talked about some of these things and at the end of it, the final project was everybody had to write a letter to whoever. Um, and this, and somebody wrote a letter to America. It was like, honestly, I could just rewrite a lot of Amos. And I was like, yeah, I think that's fair. And so, um, Martin and I talk about, we have this like unwavering commitment. So at St. Jude, we have this unwavering commitment to the scriptures and the mission of God. Like we think in the gospel, like we think those three things should not be divided. So we have a commitment to that. We have a commitment that women should have a major role. But interestingly enough, that's Martin's soapbox. It's not mine. It's his soapbox. Based on the blue chips Yes. Yeah, we're not being, we're not trying to meet Oak Cliff. We're trying to be faithful to the Lord. And the third thing is we have a commitment to social justice, which is something I brought in. And we, and we, I don't know if I've ever told you, it was like we were like speed dating when we decided to plant this church together. Like we went to North Park, uh, Starbucks, literally. And I was like, hey, bro, I'm in a context currently with a lot of men that look like you, old and white. Um, And they don't like when I talk about social justice. They don't like when I talk about racial reconciliation. They don't like when I talk about economic injustice. They don't like, and I was like, so where are you on this? And he was like, yeah, great. Run ahead. Love it. And then he was like, Nikes, like, we're not going to hide you as a woman. Like, we're going to put you up front and center. You're going to start every service. It is by design that I start the service. And I don't know if you've noticed, when I am not there, Martin likes to ask a woman to fill in for that so that the first voice you hear every Sunday is a female. The first voice anyone ever heard at St. Jude was female, and that was by design. And so all that to say, this is one of those issues, though, that I can stand up in front of a bunch of women and call them out for pornography. I can call them out for drinking too much red wine. Mommy needs her wine to call. And I'm like, that's alcoholism. I can call them out. I can call them out for a lot. The moment I start touching on that one, I'm unfaithful. And I learned that the hard way. And I just was like, I don't, I can't, I can't unsee what I see in the scriptures. And I think that's why, like, for me, I'm just like a Bible nerd. That's really all I am. And so as I started studying the scriptures, I was like, but this is literally in the scriptures. Like, I, I'm not, 
I don't like Twitter. I don't use my Twitter account. I'm not, my social media is my nieces and nephews. I'm not trying to get clout by talking about these things. I'm just trying to be faithful to what God is calling us to be. And then I just found out people like, we don't talk about that part. So then I was like, you guys are cows of Bashan. And I'm going to, no, I'm kidding. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, I'm not kidding. But, um, and I don't do it perfectly either. I had to repent. Like part of it is you read it and you go, oh, yeah, I've used my privilege in ways that have harmed people. I have to repent. And so all I just say, this is just Bible. And I'm constantly surprised. I'm less surprised now. I was constantly surprised. And when I would teach the scriptures, people would get angry. And I'm like, you just want me to stay in Philippians? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, well, too bad. So, uh, so I, Larry, I'm with you. And I think, this is, I think this is the problem in the American church. And I think we'll continue to see division and tribalism and a lack of fruit in places because I think God would say, I hate your feast. I hate I hate your sacrifices. What I desire of you is mercy, not sacrifice. So that's why people focus so much on the New Testament though. They don't oh, thousand percent. They don't even focus on Jesus. Most white churches like Paul. Yeah, even like, Jesus takes yeah, Isaiah. Yeah. yeah. Men do love Paul. <laughs> that is true. A lot of women don't like Paul. Um, I mean, I, I think sometimes we actually read ourselves into the Bible because the scripture authorizes self criticism. Jesus did self criticism. Well, I would just start with read your Bible. Okay. Uh, all right, so looking for major themes, a big one, breaking the covenant. Other major themes are calls for repentance, turn back, turn back, turn around, turn back. You'll see it over and over again. Um, and then announcement of the day of the Lord, which we need to camp out on this phrase. The day of the Lord you will see throughout the, the prophets. So the Lord has a day. Yes, the Lord has lots of them, actually. Technically, all the days belong to him. But this phrase, the day of the Lord, is a very particular phrase that the, go- that the gospels, wow, the prophet writers are using. It is, it is a day of either reckoning, if you are the victimizer, or it's a day of rescue if you are the victim. So often, the way you hear the day of the Lord is this is great and mighty day where God will pull Israel out of this pain and suffering that Israel is under. So when the prophets come and say, oh, Israel, the day of the Lord is actually coming for you. That is a switch of what they're accustomed to. They are used to the day of the Lord happening to Egypt, to Babylon. They are not used to it coming for them. And so this day of the Lord is basically, it's when God comes against wicked nations, and it's typically good news for the Israelites. So the Exodus would be a day of the Lord. That's the kind of language that it would use. And so when Amos is like, hey, Israel, guess what? It's coming for you. They're like, yeah, right, bro, get out of here. Um, The way the day of the Lord is described is often cosmic world-ending language. They're doing that for effect. The sky will be blotted out. It will be total and utter darkness. Locusts will swarm in and just, Joel, Joel, if you've never read Joel, I'm going to make y'all read it later. It's crazy. It's like locusts with helmets and they're like marching in together. And it's like, is that supposed to be literal? No, no. And people who say it is, I'm like, that, you're not understanding. Um, but it's using cosmic world ending language because it's God moving. And so they use this big language. But really it's just a day where God comes in and makes really makes things right. And depending on which side of that equation you're on, it is either an awful day or an awesome day. Uh, There are many fulfillments. There are many days of the Lord. And then there's a future fulfillment to come. Jesus on the cross is the day of the Lord. That's the final ultimate one. We didn't understand that when the prophets wrote, but that's it. He's finally dealing with death, our final enemy. Um, So it can be very bleak or exuberant joy. And again, it just depends on which side of the equation you're on. So I say this all the time when I read the prophets. 
If you put the sandals on of the wealthy, the rich, the privileged, you will not like the prophets. If you take those sandals off and put on the sandals of the weak, the poor, the afflicted, it will be good news. And so if, if, if you are reading the prophets and you're not enjoying it, good. Let it impact you. Let it hit you and sit with it and repent and change your mind on things. And don't run from it. If you're like, gosh, I do those things, repent. Do what it's going to call you to do probably in the next five verses. Just turn back. Um, but if you, if you don't, uh, let me say this, if you're uncomfortable with the language, the cosmic language, then go put the sandals on of the oppressed, and I promise you it'll read like good news. Okay, this very nice chart that I got from my own hand. Um, the prophets are not that hard. No, you heard John Bright, you heard Martin Luther. I don't know where we're at and what we're doing. They are right. It does move from past, present, and future very quickly, and then this massive day of the Lord. So there's the past. <laughs> there's the present. This little guy standing right there. There's this awful and mighty day of the Lord, and there's the future. There's this climb up, okay? If you can figure out where you, when you are as you're reading the prophets, it will help you, and they will give you massive clues, and it will help you. So if it starts talking, and oftentimes, guys, it's as simple as your English. If it's using past tense, it's probably the past. If it's using future tense, it's either day of the Lord or future. That's it. It's usually that simple, okay? But it'll help you understand. So in the past, you will hear the prophets talking about God's resume. Almost always, it's creation or exodus. Don't you remember when I brought you out from underneath the, in Egypt? Don't you remember when I created everything? Don't you remember when I set you in the world? Don't you remember? And everybody's like, no, we don't really remember. Again, it uses past tense verbs. It's going to help you. If it says, I once did this thing, it's not the future. I don't know why Martin Luther didn't get this. I don't know, guys. I feel like he needed my handy chart. If I had just given him that, he would have been fine. You'd be amazed at how helpful this is. I have done this for many people. They're like, oh, and I'm like, I don't know, but it works. All right. The present. It's often indictments against Israel or Judah or Edom, whoever it is, and it's legal language. You don't necessarily need to pick up on that, but it's like... Um, We'll get to Amos, and it's like, for four accusation, for three accusations and of four, this is what I charge against you. It'll say, I charge you with this. It's sort of like this idea of, like, you're standing in, in the court. Um, this is the stuff that shows you what makes God mad. It is absolutely essential to understand the character of God, to move the way through the prophets and say, oh, so God doesn't like it when you trample the poor. That should be self-evident. But he goes in and just says it, too. So you don't even have to make that up. When people are like, God cares about the poor, and you're like, you sound like a socialist. No, I just read my Bible. Like, that's all I'm doing here. Um, I really, like, I really am just a Bible nerd. And everybody's like, oh, you're a social justice warrior. I'm like, that is so kind. <laughs> I'm not, though, because I get around those people, and they do hard, hard work. And I'm like, I'm a resident theologian for the coolest church in the world. That's what I am. I just try to be faithful to the scriptures. Um, it will use present tense language, and there's often threats of judgment to follow. If you don't turn back, I will trample your vineyard. I will, vineyard is usually a metaphor for Israel. When God starts taking out their vineyards, I think it's so funny. It's like, not our wine, but it's like a big metaphor for, I'm mad at you, Israel. So, But he does take their wine from them. So, you know, no partying if you're mad, if God's mad at you. So, uh, but again, indictments, you'll hear the things that makes God mad. And you'll be surprised how little of it has to do with sex, truly. And that we're, we'll talk about that later. Um, the day of the Lord. Now you messed up. Now nah, it's too late. You have messed up. And you are now going to experience the day of the Lord. Armies are coming. This is God's judgment. And it's often an overturning of the created order. Mountains are going to be thrown in the sea. The sun will shine no more. The, man, whatever. The waves will come up. Whatever. And even in the midst of that. Now you don't mess up now. There's still usually a chance to turn back. It's crazy, y'all. Like Babylon's marching. And God's like, it's not too late. Come with me. And they're like, we'll take our chances against Babylon. We made our military alliances. Uh, newsflash, they don't help. <laughs> so he told them, they're not going to help you. They will not help you. And they're like, ah, God, you're so silly. Everybody has military alliances. How'd that work out for them? Not so great. And then finally, the future. Of course, it uses future tense. 
restoration cometh. There is a near and a far restoration often, so you got to figure it out. And you're meant to find parallels to Jesus accomplishing the future passages. Jeremiah 31, I have plans for you, hope in the future. I'm going to give you a new covenant. Who does the new covenant? Yeah, Isaiah 61, I made you guys read. Hey, one will rise up. He will proclaim freedom for the captives. Jesus makes it easy on you. He literally just reads it and says, um, I'm here. And you're like, oh. Now, for everybody else in the room, do you think they actually thought Jesus was the answer to Isaiah 61? No, of course not. They're like, oh, who is this nutter butter? This is Mary's boy. You don't even know who his daddy is, right? That's the, what they think of him. And he's like, I'm the one Isaiah talked about. And they're like, no, he's not. Uh, but this is truly, I know this sounds so simple. This will help you. <laughs> so the past will remind you of all that God has done. And the reason why he's reminding of them is because he's taking them back to the covenant. I'm your maker, and I'm in relationship with you. The present is you are doing wrong things. And if you don't stop, there is a great and mighty day coming for you. But don't worry. I'll never, ever, ever give up on you. And so even in the midst of exile, even in the midst of them doing all this wrong stuff, God's like, I'll come get you. He says, you won't even turn back. Like, I know you're not going to come back. I'll come get you, which is why Jesus has to come to us. We never were going to go to him. He has to come to us. But pretty amazing that even in the midst of all of this, that's the message. So we're going to do Amos 1 together as a group. So everybody turn to Amos. We're going to read through it because you're going to understand this. And you're going to be like, Martin Luther, what are you talking about? This is so easy. Past Daniel, past Hosea, right after Joel. Hosea, Joel, Amos. Y'all, when I took my prophets class, you had to write down goals for your class. I think I've told you this before. And I was like, I don't know, to get an A is always my goal in class. That's my only goal in class, sadly. And, um, and so I didn't know what to write, and we had to write three goals. And so one of them was that I would memorize the order of the books. of Because I, I still don't know like to this day, I still don't know the order. I have to like go look at the table of contents every time. So if you're ever that person that gets called on to read it, there's a very good chance. Also, I don't. I tend to think of the books in the order in which they are they are written, not the order they're organized. And I cannot tell you how many times I have flipped through my Bible looking for a book, and Alex has had to lean over and be like, "Job is with the wisdom literature," and I'm like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> I'm like in Genesis looking for Job. Um, okay, we're gonna look at Amos. So just to remind you guys, Amos is talking to Israel, the northern kingdom. He is a farmer from Tekoa. He's actually from the south. They don't really get along, so that's also going to play. So now you can imagine, this guy's showing up, this little farmer from Tekoa. All right, the words of Amos. Uh, intro accusation. Yeah, okay, I'm going to explain this to you as we keep going. But anyways, the words of Amos, who is one of the sheep breeders from Tekoa, what he saw regarding Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. All right, why do you think that the prophet's giving us all this information in the beginning? Time frame. Time frame. Yeah, we know when this is written. We would, if we were in Israel, we would know these kings. We would know about when this is. Uh, just so you know, Jeroboam's are always bad. If you ever see a Jeroboam in the Bible, bad guy. There's more than one. They're always bad. They're buttheads. Um, yeah, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. What earthquake? We don't know, but do they know? Yeah, yeah they know, right. They know. It's kind of like when I say 9-11. We know, they know. So, what if they, so again, they're just using this as a time frame. Okay. The Lord roars from Zion and makes his voice heard from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the summit of Carmel withers. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Why? Yeah, let's use some context clues. Why is it a bad thing? Yeah. Yeah. Cosmic language, right? But God himself is the lion. You can wonder why I love Amos, right? Yeah. So God is roaring from Zion. So Amos is walking into Israel, and he's like, God's pissed. That's what he's saying. And he's, he's going to let you know, okay? All right, so... There is a pattern to the beginning of Amos where he does an intro to the nation that he's talking about, the accusation, and the judgment. So this is all present tense, right? Because he's saying, hey, woe to you, so-and-so. This is the accusation God's bringing. Here's the judgment. 
each time you're going to be able to tell me what made God mad. Okay? So we're going to work through this. Now, I want to explain to you what's happening here. Israel hates their neighbors. Okay? Amos is walking into Israel, and the first person he's talking about is Damascus, and then Gaza, and then Tyre, and then Edom, and then the Ammonites. They don't like them. Why might he be starting with them? Israel does not like their neighbors. So we've got this prophet walking into Israel, and the first thing he's going to say is God's going to bring judgment against Damascus and Gaza and Tyre and Edom and the Ammonites and go on. Why do you think he might be starting with the foreigners? It's a rhetorical device. He's trapping them. So I walk in, and I look at my niece, my oldest niece, who's done something wrong, and I go, do you know what AJ did, her younger sister? AJ didn't do her chores. Ooh, is she gonna get in trouble? Oh yeah, what do you think is a fair punishment? I think she should be grounded for a week. You know, it's interesting because you didn't do your chores, Jaden. <laughs> what do you think is a fair punishment, Jaden? Uh, that's exactly what is happening here. It is a literary device, and if you look at a map, it's literally, he starts on their outside and he moves in, literally. It's, it's wild. Um, so we're going to do this intro accusation judgment. You guys are going to tell me what makes God mad. So the Lord says, so this is verse three, I will not relent from punishing Damascus for three crimes, even four, because the threshold, because they threshed Gilead with iron sledges. Therefore, I will send fire against Hez Hazael's palace. That's the guy in charge. And it will consume Ben-Hadad's citadels. These are all the leaders. I will break down the gates of Damascus. I will cut off the ruler from the Valley of Avon. And the one who wields the scepter from Beth Eden, the people of Aram will be exiled to Kerr, the Lord has spoken. That's a lot of language of like, he's, he's calling out cities. So if I were to say, Texas, you may be mad. I'm going to take down Austin. I'm going to kick San Antonio in the teeth. I'm going to burn Houston. That's what he's essentially saying. But well, Dallas. yeah, yeah, Dallas is fine. <laughs> Dallas is a haven. They do no wrong. Yeah. So he says, I'm mad at Damascus for three crimes, even four. You're going to see this. For three crimes, even four. For three crimes, even four. You're going to see this repeated. Because they threshed. Gilead with iron sledges. What do they do? Does anybody know what Gilead is? Yeah. So what do they do with the iron sledges? Yeah, they plundered it. So, so Israel's like, yeah. Yeah, Damascus beat us up. Get them, right? We're going to keep going. So we're going to move in closer. I will not relent from punishing Gaza for three crimes, even four. There it is. Because they exiled a whole community, handing them over to Edom. Therefore, I'm going to burn down Gaza. It will consume its citadels. I'll cut off the ruler of Ashdod, the one who wields the scepter from Ashkelon. I will also turn my hand against Ekron, and the remainder of the Philistines will perish. The Lord God has spoken. Again, those are internal cities toward the end. What do they do? took a whole community and handed them over to another nation. Na, 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 na. Okay, now we're mad at Gaza, and now all of Israel's like, yeah! Okay, I will not relent from punishing Tyre for three crimes, even four. There's our repeat. Because they handed over a whole community to exiles to Edom. Where have we heard this before? Right. Immediately above it. Therefore, I will set fire, and it will consume its citadels. Apparently, they don't have that much to talk about. Not that important, but you still don't get to just take out whole countries. All right, Edom. Anybody know who the Edomites are? Esau. Esau. They are meant to be brotherly to the people of Israel, okay? For three crimes, even four, because he pursued his brother with the sword. He stifled his compassion. His anger tore at him continually, and he harbored his rage incessantly. Therefore... I will send fire against Teman, and it will consume the citadels of Basra. Again, those are the cities of Edom. What did Edom do? Yeah, his brother's Israel in this case. So now Israel's real mad, right? Because they're like, yeah, they did attack us. So there's a story in the narrative where Israel is supposed to walk through the land of Edom as they're going to safety, and they say, can we pass through? And Edom says, <laughs> no. And then they attack them when they're weak. And God's like, are you kidding me? I made you. So again, Amos is, doo -doo 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 -doo. Damascus, yeah, tired, yeah, Edom, yeah, we're still going. 
The Lord will not relent from punishing the Ammonites for three crimes, even four, because they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to enlarge their territory. <coughs> Therefore, I'm going to burn them to the ground. Their king and his princes will go into exile together. The Lord has spoken. What did the Ammonites do? Gilead is again Israel. What did the Ammonites do? In order to do what? There are rules of engagement. You don't kill who? Yeah. Yep. The Ammonites are bad, bad, bad. Anytime you see Ammonites, they're bad. They're like Jeroboam. Bad, bad. Um, I will not relent from punishing Moab for three crimes, even four, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. You're not supposed to desecrate the dead, just so you know. Therefore, I will send fire against Moab, and it will consume the citadel, blah, 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 and I will cut it off and kill all the officials. So what did, the, what did Moab do? There you go. Yeah, not supposed to do that. But it also means he killed the king, and he made a mockery of him. And he, like, again, it's violence, right? What is God consistently getting mad at right now? Are you allowed to use violence to get your land? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sound like it. Are you allowed to get violence to plunder people? Nope. This is where it gets really good. Who is Judah? Yeah, it's the southern kingdom, right? So now he's, again, we're narrowing in. Here comes Amos. He's going for the kill soon. I will not relent from punishing Judah. Yeah, our stupid little sister. Or three crimes, even four, because they have rejected the instruction of the Lord and have not kept his statutes. The lies that their ancestors followed have led them astray. Therefore, I will send fire against Judah and it will consume the citadels of Jerusalem. At this point, all of Israel is what? Cheering. All our enemies are getting destroyed. Amos, you can come here anytime you want, my man. And he says, oh, but there's one more. But wait, there's more. And then he says, the Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Israel. And everybody goes, record scratch. <laughs> what now? And he says, you want to know why? For three crimes, even four. Because they sell a righteous person for silver. And a needy person for a pair of sandals. They trample the heads of the poor on the dust of the ground. And they obstruct the path of the needy. Y'all remember when we talked about the law? What are you supposed to do for blind people and deaf people? That's right. A man and his father have sexual relations with the same girl. That's most likely cultic practice. They're sleeping with the same prostitute at the cult. Profaning my holy name. They stretch out beside every altar on garments taken as collateral. And in the house of their God, they drink wine obtained through fines. And yet I destroyed the Amorite as Israel advanced. His height was like the cedars, and he was sturdy as the oak. Where are we at now? What's he doing now? He's already brought his accusations, right? What is he mad about? They're injustice, right? Did y'all expect him to say that? You trample the needy? You sell people for sandals? The righteous person most likely means a bribe in court? You bribe the court with money? You trade out the poor for, sand for sandals? You think people are less important than sandals? And then all of a sudden he switches into past tense. Yet I destroyed the Amorites as Israel advanced. Now we're going back. How could you do this? Do you not know what I did for you? Now he's going to tell them all the things he did for you. I destroyed the Amorites as Israel advanced. His height was like the cedars, and he was as sturdy as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and roots beneath. I brought you from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness in order to possess the land of the Amorites. I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is this not the case, Israelites? Oh, it's personal now, isn't it? It got real, didn't it? Oh, we like it when you kick in Damascus' teeth. And now he's talking to Israel. And it just got real personal. You like this land you're on, Israel? Who do you think got this for you? This is the Lord's declaration, but you... Made the Nazarites drink wine. What's a Nazarite? Yeah, men who are set apart, can't cut their hair, can't drink wine. Can't touch dead bodies. Can't touch dead bodies. Thank you, Larry. It's like there's something else I can't do. Yeah, and here they are. And these are, these are men set apart for the Lord. And what are the Israelites doing? Drink that wine. 
Like, we don't need to be des- we don't need to consecrate the Lord. And you commanded the prophets, do not prophesy. We don't want to hear it. They speak for God. What are they telling God? Shut up. We don't want to hear from you, God. Look, I'm about to crush you in your place as a wagon crushes when full of grain. Escape will fail the swift. The strong one will not maintain his strength, and the warrior will not save his life. I don't care how big and bad and strong you think you are. I'm going to get every one of you. (laughs) If you want to learn how to talk trash, just read the Bible. The archer will not stand his ground. The one who is swift of foot will not save himself. And the one riding a horse will not save his life. Even the most courageous of the warriors will flee naked on that day. You think you're tough? I'm God. You can't fight me. This is the Lord's declaration, right? What do we get up from all this? Don't mess with God. Yeah. (laughs) Or his people. Who are his people? Who is he worried about? Yeah. At one point he's going to say, I, you were low and I brought you up and you pushed the poor down. He's going to say that I did that. You were here. You, don't you remember? You were slaves. You really don't remember that? And I rescued you. And now you sell righteous people for silver and you trample the poor? Come on, Israel. And then you go to your pastor, and every Sunday he goes, all right, you want to know what makes God mad? When wives don't obey. (laughs) What? When you vote for a certain politician. uh... I wonder if your Bible is pushing you. Yeah. Oh. Oh, my goodness gracious. We were just remixing there. We're already in the book of Revelation. Yeah, we are. You're going to mix. Thank you all so much. Yeah, this is, this is, I'm telling you, you read through this stuff. You get good at reading through this stuff. I mean, y'all, go home and read Amos. And if you don't know how to read the rest of it, just listen to my podcast. But then we get to chapter 5, and I don't want you to miss this. Turn to chapter 5. There's lament coming, and this is why I want you to hear it. God is mad. And if you're not accustomed to God's anger, it can make you uncomfortable, right? You're like, jeepers. I didn't know God spoke like that. But then, listen to this message that I'm singing for you, a lament for the house of Israel. She has fallen. Virgin Israel will never rise again. She lies abandoned on her land with no one to raise her up. For the Lord God says, the city that marches out a thousand strong will only have a hundred left, and the one that marches out a hundred strong will only have ten left in the house of Israel. Israel's not going to make it. But then he says, for the Lord says to the house of Israel, seek me and live. It's not too late. Do not seek Bethel or go to Gilgal. What they're saying is don't go to these holy cities and seek something other than me. Or journey to Beersheba, or for Gilgal will certainly go into exile, and Bethel will come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live or he will spread like a fire throughout the house of Joseph it will consume everyone or everything with no one at Bethel to extinguish it those who turn justice into wormwood also throw righteousness to the ground but the one who made the Pleiades and the Orion you know what that is mm-hmm. yeah so this is God who turns darkness into dawn and darkens day into night who summons the water of the sea and pours it out of the surface of the earth the Lord is his name and he brings destruction on the strong, and it falls on the fortress. And then he goes down to verse 14, So pursue good and not evil, so that you may live. And the Lord, the God of armies, will be with you, as you have claimed. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice at the city gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of armies, will be gracious. We have just had the biggest smack talk from God. The accusations are real. He's like, I'm going to kick your teeth in. You guys absolutely ignore me constantly. And it's not too late. Seek me and live. Perhaps the God of Joseph will be gracious to you. Verse 18, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Remember, the day of the Lord was good news for Israel. And now he's saying, woe to you for those who long for it. What will the day of the Lord be for you? It will be darkness and not light and on and on and on and on. 
and on and on and on. And this is so good. And then you get to the very end, the last chapter. All this you have forsaken me. You have defiled the land. You will not escape. I don't care how strong you are. I'm going to burn you to the ground. <coughs> but it's not too late. And then we get to the very end. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When the plowman will overtake the reaper. In other words, there will be so much to reap. It's so good. And the one who treads grapes, the sower of the seed. The mountains will drip with sweet wine. And the hills will flow with it. Again, the vine is always, <laughs> the wine is always Israel's. <laughs> it's always wine when God's around. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. Remember when he said, woe to Israel, you'll never rise again. And then right here he's like, listen, I will restore you Israel. They will rebuild and occupy ruined cities, plant vineyards and drink their wine, make gardens and eat their produce. I will plant them on their land and they will never again be uprooted for the land I have given them. The Lord your God has spoken. How can that be true? Those promises God made. How can that be true? Yeah. He's far more gracious. And he forgives. And he, he restores. And he keeps his covenant even when we don't. No, he doesn't lie. He says, you're mine forever. I'm going to kick you in your teeth, Israel. But also, I'm going to restore you. I'll come get you. I'll make it right. Because I will not quit. You will. You need to know it makes me mad. It really does. I don't like it when you treat the poor that way. There are parts in the, the, the prophets where he's like, hey, you guys trample the poor, and then you come to me, and you're like, hey, is this fat and calf good? We good? And he's like, no, I hate your fat and calf. That's not how this works. Uh, but in the end, they still get to be restored. Everybody tracking? Past, present, future, day of the Lord, covenant, faithful, great. So now you're going to do it in your groups. Okay. Grab your groups. You will just spend five minutes on this. Uh, who wants Joel 2? So y'all can pick first. Y'all want Joel 2, Habakkuk 1, Mike, Joel 2. That's a fun one. The, yeah, that's a really fun one. The locusts go marching one by one. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. What do you want? T, it's your choice. Okay. Y'all take Ezekiel. It's dirty. Have uh, fun with it. <laughs> Have fun with it. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you guys are going to read through it, and you see the right side? You need to be able to answer, is there covenant language? When are we? Calls for repentance. Accusations <laughs> against whom? What made God mad? Just any, anything y'all want to pull from it. Spend five minutes, and I'll pull you back in, um, and you're good to go. Um, okay, our dirty, dirty Ezekiel group. Um, what's the big gist of Ezekiel 16? What is happening in this passage? God is basically talking to uh, about, about Judah and talking about how um, he took Judah from being a place very low and a place corrupt and a wonder and basically was talking about her as a bride yeah. um, and how he's been dressing her up and made her really high and perfect. I mean, not perfect, but... Yeah. Yeah, I say, do you see covenantal language? Yes. Very much, right? And you get a sense of like, so when they're disobeying God, what God's trying to help them understand is I'm not some way up in the sky, distant God who has a list of rules that you broke. I'm in relationship with you. And Ezekiel, if you haven't read Ezekiel 16, I would encourage you to do so because he's like, look, I made you my bride. And I gave you fine jewelry and all this amazing stuff. And then he says, you prostituted yourself away. And he goes, actually, it's worse than prostitution. At least a prostitute gets paid. And everyone's like, oh. He's like, you paid them to defile you. And you're like, oh. Which is, uh, it is, <laughs> it, it is um, sexual language for making treaties with foreign enemies, too. That's what he's accusing them of. So they're, they're, uh, unwillingness to remain a faithful bride is all that. So is there a call for repentance? Not, on not explicitly, but we will. Uh, we can yeah. get to it and then hopefully you take something away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
It's very, very metaphorical, though. And so that's what they say. So Ezekiel 16, he says, hey, listen, I saw you. You were basically abandoned. You were tossed out. You were covered in blood, amniotic blood, essentially. So I rescued you. And I waited until you were at the appropriate age, and I married you, and I gave you this jewelry. I, I treated you so beautifully, and then you just you betrayed me. What does that reveal about God, that he chooses to use that kind of language when he's talking to them? Weakness. Yeah. Little rinky dink Israel in Egypt. And he went and got his people, right? He's like, this is personal. You don't think it's personal. It's personal, Israel. Corey, you had enough cake for one lifetime, dog. <laughs> Corey, come. Come. Up. Up. Sit. You're going to be messed up, babe. All right. Which one you guys had? Habakkuk 1? Yeah. What's going on there? So what y'all get out of that? What's what is Habakkuk mad about? First of all, injustice. Yeah, right. I mean that's his point. And he's like, hey, do you not see what I see? And God responds with, yes, I do. And I'm doing something about it. I'm doing something about it. So can God use things that we don't expect for His purposes? Yeah. I saw them in Habakkuk 1, there's that really popular verse where it's like, behold, I'm doing something in your day you would never imagine. And people are like, yeah, tattoo that right there in Hebrew. Put that on my shirt. And I'm like, he's sending Babylon as a foreign army to come take out Judah. That's not what you want tattooed on your body. It sounds great. It's not what that means. And so, yeah, so it's one of those things. So it gives you a sense of the character of Habakkuk, though, right? Because he's upset. He's upset, and he cries out to God, and then God answers his prayer, probably not in the way Habakkuk thought he would, but God's like, oh, I see it, buddy. I will not relent forever. Yeah, good. Uh, you guys went with, what y'all did? Joel. Oh, you did Joel. Yeah, so tell us about the ants that go marching one by one, the locusts that go marching one by one. What do we know? How so? Yeah, it's well, good. It's referring to past times that they did it too, right? Yeah. So y'all's time flip flopped, right? Yeah, it was the very future kind of day of the Lord came yeah. to the first. Joel's like, they're going to kill you, and don't you remember what he did? But here they come. Oh, we were good, but now this you're in trouble. That Luther yeah, that's right. I think that's right. He just didn't like Joel. But the, yeah, Joel's a tough book, and that is because he's moving in this time frame, and you have to keep track of it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the people who make your Bibles, they help y'all. So just so you know. And then last one is the Lord will pour out the yeah. Spirit. So it's like you get So y'all had all different times, right? So let's say you didn't have somebody from Zondervan or whoever made your Bible putting that in there. You think you'd be able to figure that out, though? Yeah. yeah. I know, but I know it looks ridiculous to have that stick figure, but it's actually helpful to go, oh, okay, so this is past. These are reminders of God's faithfulness. This is covenant. Oh, we're in the present. This is what they did wrong. That makes God mad. Okay, the day of the Lord's coming. And for you guys, what does the day of the Lord look like for you guys? Big cosmic language, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Anguish. If they took y'all's and turned it into a movie, Earthquakes. it would be scary. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, but but that's the point, right? I mean, so I would say Joel's probably one of those. So Joel, if you, where's my trusty chart? 
Uh, Joel, everybody knows Joel because his he loved the term Day of the Lord. That's where you get. In fact, that's the theme of Joel, the Day of the Lord. Um, and he gets a big old locust because he sends the locust in. But um, talking to the southern kingdom, they need to repent or it will be bad. Joel's where you go. If you want to do some weird apocalyptic into the world movie, just go to Joel. It's got all the imagery you need. Put some helmets on some locusts, have them march in and kill everybody. It's good. Blot out the sun. We good? So y'all get it, right? There's not many things you don't understand, right? We read through Amos, and you're like, I don't know what Kibron is. I don't know what Kerr is. That's what commentaries are for. You just look those things up, and they're like, oh, that's a city in Damascus. And you go, oh, yeah, great, got it. But the big ideas of covenant, when are we, calls for repentance, what makes God mad, all that stuff, that's the driving point of the prophets. So what's our big so what? The prophets are mournful people. They're not just fire and brimstone people. And they are deeply grieved by the sin and destruction, but they're bold enough to call it out. And so I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to double down on it. If your prophets are all fury and no lament, be leery. And this applies mostly to online. Um, But there's a weird subsection of Christianity that there's just people online just patrolling the Internet. And I'm like, go love someone and read a book. But... (laughs) There's nothing wrong with speaking truth to power. In fact, we need more people to do it. Um, but if you're just speak, screaming into the ether and you're not mournful over sin and you're not relationally connected, then I'm not sure you're actually being very prophetic. Uh, you might be a clanging symbol, so be careful. God was and is so very, very patient. This is why Jonah's mad. This is why Jonah's mad. It's because some of those people do repent. And he's like, I knew it. I knew you'd be gracious. And he's like, do I not offer you the same thing, Jonah? Corey, you are really pushing the limits of your invitation here, my dog. (laughs) Go over there. Go over there. There you go. (laughs) She knows I am gracious. Ask Robin. I'm the rule breaker with her. This This is me reaping what I have sown into that animal. But that's all right. Um. Yeah, God is... You will be shocked at how many times it is cosmic. And then he's like, but hey, it's okay. You can come back. And you'll be shocked. And you'll be shocked at how often, even in the midst of, hey, you did forfeit the land, then he says, but I will come and restore you. Um, And in fact, we see in the Bible the restoration for so many. Um, Restoration amid exile is covenant language. (coughs) God's not going to quit on his people. He never does. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't consequences for sin. There just are. Um, But that's why Christ came. And so the good news is we are in a covenant, which means God will never forsake you. Never. If you can look at what Israel and Judah did, where they are literally trampling the poor, they are engaged. Amos talks about how they're engaged in, in uh, slave trade. I mean, like, when you're talking about killing people so you can advance your land, like you're talking about barbaric ways of living to the extremeness, and God is still in covenant with them, he can handle your failures too. Yeah, he will not give up on you. This is why we need to read the prophets. Because too many people are like, well, I'm just too much for God. And I'm like, have you read Amos? Have you read Joel? Yes, there are consequences for it. Your marriage might end. Your relationships might end. People get hurt. You will get hurt. People get hurt when sin goes unchecked, which is why it is good news that God checks our sin. But he does not give up on us. And that is good news. Listening to what makes God mad is an important part of being his children. Injustice is a very big deal to God. Oppressing the least of these is a very big deal to God. And if your pastor rails against sexual sin and abortion, but he looks the other way when men are beating their wives or watching pornography, you need to be leery. We don't get to pick our favorite sins and just go, oh. Um, We've talked about this. We don't need to hit that. Micah 6, 8. Anybody know what Micah 6, 8 says? That's it. Seek justice, love mercy, and walk on with God. Go type through this on your foreheads. This is what God is saying. He gets to the end of Micah, and he's like, Micah, 
Tell the people, this is what I want for you. Seek justice, love mercy, Jonah, and walk humbly with your God. That's what I want from you all. It's not cryptic. You don't use the prophecy for some cryptic message of Daniel. What's Nebuchadnezzar? Going? No, just be just, be merciful, and be humble. That's what God is asking of us. I was in Israel a couple of years ago. Um, do we have time? I know it's 8.32. We got time? Okay, I was in Israel, and uh, that's Alex's life first. So she wanted to ring, and so she gets this book, this Hebrew Bible. It's English Hebrew Bible. And she's flipping through it like this to try and find Micah 6 a, and then she goes, oh, your book is backwards. So she starts doing this, and he goes, oh, your book is backwards. Your books are backwards. How do you know our books are backwards? And I said, well, actually, Broham, um, Christians invented the codex, which is the form of the book that you know, and it was Greek, so it did go this way, so your book is backwards. And he was like, okay, I don't know about books. And I was like, I was like well, I do. And so I said, we're looking for Micah 6 eight. He goes, Micah 6 eight. Micah 6 eight. You know what Micah 6 eight says? And I said, I do. Do you? And he said, no. He's a guy living in Jerusalem. He's in the old city. And he's like, oh, what does God require of you, old man? This is good. What does God want? <laughs> Seek justice. That's good. Love mercy. Pretty good. Walk humbly with your God. Who could do such a thing? And I said, Jesus. Ah, oh, you Christians. I said, no, but really, that's who does it. And then he asked us to follow him. And he was like, I'll, I'll do the ring. Stop talking about Jesus. I'm like, all right. But it was one of those really profound moments where you, you, it's his scriptures. So I was like, hey, bro, these are yours too. But he, he's saying, oh, this is, this is what God wants of us. And I'm like, this is what God wants. And you're going to fail. Which is why Christ comes. And he's the perfect representation of justice, mercy, and humility. And when you fall short, you are put in him so that you can be just and merciful and humble. So do that. That's the point of the prophets. Mark, you want to pray us out of here?